Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 166 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sobolski, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. When you take a trip to a museum or see a display of treasures at a library, you'll often come across a beautiful single page from a medieval manuscript with a little tag that probably doesn't have much information about its origins. Sometimes, if you're visiting an archive, a scrap piece of thousand-year-old parchment may fall out of an early printed book you're looking at, or sometimes you may be cruising eBay and see an illuminated initial in a frame. These are manuscript fragments, lone survivors of medieval books, or codices, which have been dismembered or destroyed. Luckily, intrepid medieval scholars like my next guest are finding ways to collect fragments together and sometimes even reassemble them digitally to learn their origin stories. This week, I spoke with Dr. Lisa Fagan Davis about manuscript fragments and fragmentology. Lisa is the executive director of the Medieval Academy of America, and she regularly teaches classes on manuscripts at the Simmons University School of Library and Information Science. In addition to her many articles on manuscript studies, she's the author of La Chronique Anonyme Universelle, Reading and Writing History in 15th Century France, as well as being the co-author of the Directory of Pre-1600 Manuscripts in the United States and Canada. Although we didn't talk about it in this episode, Lisa is also a world expert on the infamous and mysterious Voynich Manuscript. Our conversation on fragments, how they get reassembled, and what they can teach us is coming up right after this. Well, thank you, Lisa, for coming on the podcast to talk about fragments. I'm excited about this. Thanks so much for coming on. Oh, it's such a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. So one of the things you definitely work on is fragmentology. Can you tell us what that is? Sure. So it's a field that's been around as long as people have been studying manuscripts. They've been studying manuscript fragments. But the idea of focusing on fragments as its own subspecialty in within manuscript studies, codicology, paleography, is relatively new because working with fragments really involves a different skill set in some ways than working with a whole codex because it requires extra research, extra thought about the different layers of provenance evidence that you find on a fragment, learning how to read that evidence to reconstruct something about the fragment's history. That's a relatively new field, maybe 10, 15 years, I would say, that people have really begun thinking about working with fragments as a real subspecialty. So you are the book detectives, you're the OG book detectives, right? If there is a missing leaf, you're the ones to find it. Is that right? Yes, that's the idea. It's the detective work. It's very satisfying. It's frustrating, lots of dead ends. But when you find the thing you're looking for, it's it's really thrilling. It's a thrilling moment. You find yourself jumping up and down, doing a little happy dance in the library <laughs> and people staring at you. But that's all right. It's worth it. As medievalists, I think we're used to people staring at us. So yes, that's fun. true. <laughs> <laughs> also true. <laughs> so just to give people a concept of why this is important, how many fragments are we talking about worldwide? Are we talking about like there's five fragments that maybe don't have a home? How many are we talking about? Oh my gosh, Uh, actual fragments of pre-1600 manuscripts. So a lot depends on how you want to define it. My own specialization is Western Europe, just because that's my field of linguistics and what I've been studying in terms of the context for fragments. But of course, if you want to expand that to include fragments from Africa, fragments from around the Mediterranean, fragments, you know, further towards China, India, Syria, it's limitless. It's (laughs) hundreds of thousands of pieces and they can be found anywhere. My particular interest at the moment is fragments in North America, North American collections. So fragments of manuscripts from the Western European Middle Ages that have made their way to North America by all sorts of means, figuring out where they are, figuring out how to identify them, training students and librarians about where you might look in your own library to find hidden fragments that you might not even know you have in your collection and then what to do with them once you find them, how to promote them, how to 
get them online as quickly as possible, even if you don't know what they are, so that others can do the work of identifying them. Yeah, we're really going to dig into how that works, because I think it's really interesting and also super important work. But let's backtrack for a second and think about, so we know that that manuscripts are always going to be damaged. It's been, you know, a thousand years or at the outside, 400 years since these were created. And people deliberately take apart manuscripts. So why are they doing this? I think it's something that has evolved over time. Why are people dismembering these manuscripts to begin with? So there are lots of reasons why manuscripts may end up fragmented. I like to think of it as three flavors, three eras of fragmentation. So the first is early modern, late medieval and early modern recycling. So that you can't blame people for that, right? They're taking a manuscript that maybe is out of date, the, it has musical notation that no one can read anymore. The liturgy has changed through liturgical reform or they can't read the script anymore, you know, if it's written in some, you know, gothic, difficult, challenging script to read. <laughs> they can't read it anymore if the manuscript is not of value intrinsically yet in the early modern period. And so a binder might take a, frag fragment a manuscript that's out of date, that's out of use, maybe damaged, and reuse the pages as part of the binding structure because parchment is so valuable as a resource. So if you can reuse it rather than killing a perfectly good animal to make new parchment, that's not a bad thing in terms of thinking about resource management. But you also find fragments like that reused in like a bishop's mitre or lining a dress as a support to, to line the hem of a dress or the pockets of a, a medieval early modern dress. And so parchment pops up in all sorts of surprising places. So that's kind of the first piece. The second piece is as manuscripts begin to be valued intrinsically as works of art, not necessarily for their text so much, but as works of art, you start to find collectors in the 18th, 19th centuries cutting out initials mm -hmm. and framing them or putting them in scrapbooks. So that's kind of the second piece is when you start to find people cutting out images from a manuscript, leaving behind these spoliated husks. And then in the last phase, which is ongoing, unfortunately, is when you start to see dealers taking whole manuscripts and dismembering them page by page and selling off the pages one by one at a, a massive profit. And this is where it really becomes an ethical issue, more so even than the 18th century collectors. You know, it's my book. If I want to cut it up, I'll cut it up. That's the, That was the attitude then. Now what you start to see is starting in the early 20th century is people like Otto Eggy and Philip Duchenez all the way up through, you know, someone who has a, a manuscript they bought at Christie's yesterday. And then the next day you find it in pieces for sale on eBay. And it's a way for dealers to make a lot more money. You make a lot more money taking a manuscript and selling it off page by page than you do selling the whole object. And that's, of course, a bad thing. Nobody wants to encourage that practice. And that's where the ethical issues of buying and selling fragments really come into play. Is you have to think about if you are going to buy this leaf of a book of hours, are you tacitly encouraging the practice? Mm -hmm. Or is there a way to value the fragments without promoting fragmentation? And that, I think, is a real challenge. And everyone, everyone has to decide for themselves where they want to draw that line. There are some institutions that will not buy whole leaves. They just refuse to. It's, they, that's just their policy that they're not going to buy whole leaves. And then there are others who will just draw the line somewhere and say, if it was cut up 100 years ago, then there's no reason not to buy it, as opposed to it being cut up yesterday. It's it's like the, the analogy is elephant ivory. You yeah. can buy ivory that was sourced 400 years ago, but you don't want to buy ivory that was sourced yesterday, mm -hmm. right? And in that case, there's a, an actual legal line where ivory is legal versus not legal. And unfortunately, dismembering manuscripts is not illegal. Yeah, um, It is not against the law. And so it, it, it continues today. 
it's really a problem. Well, let's talk about that for a second, only because Otto Eggie's argument, I think, was that I dismember these manuscripts so that people who have less money can have the chance to touch a manuscript and frame it instead of having one person buy a codex and have it in a museum or something where people can't touch it. So can we dig into this argument? Why is it important to keep manuscripts together? What can we learn from them when they are together? Well, so let's talk about Otto Eggy for a second. So <laughs> yes, yeah, so that was Eggy's whole defense. He labeled himself a biblioclast proudly. He, you know, wrote an article called I am a biblioclast. And <laughs> that's pretty clear. Really felt, I know, I know, proudly. This was in, you know, the 1930s. And he really felt he was doing the world a favor. And I understand that argument. So basically what he said was hardly anyone can afford a whole manuscript. And that's that's true, but everyone can afford a leaf. And his argument was, you get a leaf and you get a leaf, and you get a leaf. <laughs> that everyone should, it shouldn't just be the, the rich institutions. It shouldn't be the Morgan libraries and the Houghton libraries and the Beineke's who get to own this stuff and their patrons, their students and faculty shouldn't be the only ones who get to use it. And so by doing what he did, which was I keep saying this because I don't want to, I don't want anyone to think that I think this was a good thing. It was not a good thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. He cut up hundreds of manuscripts. He destroyed them. But something good came out of it, which was that all of these little institutions all over North America now have teaching collections of manuscript leaves that they can use, that they do use for teaching students about codicology and paleography and, you know, to get their hands on parchment. I don't think it's black and white necessarily. I think what he did was a terrible thing, but he was absolutely right that it gave all of these tiny little collections the opportunity to have this kind of material and take care of it and offer it to students to study and work on. And that has transformed careers and lives. You know, I know a lot of curators who came to medieval studies because they were introduced to this material that Otto Eggy dismembered. Mm -hmm. So it's a it's a complicated question. <laughs> I, I definitely think there is enough stock out there that there is absolutely no excuse for anyone to cut up a manuscript anymore. There's no possible excuse for it. It's abhorrent and it should not happen anymore. But it happened 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. And what can we do about it? Well, we can start trying to repair that damage. We can't repair it physically. There's mm -hmm. no way we're ever going to gather all of those, you know, fallen leaves. We can't rake them together, <laughs> it's a metaphor a little bit, and physically put the manuscript back together. It's not going to happen, but we can do it digitally. And that's the kind of work that's really exciting to me. And when you start then putting these things back together, you really do see what's been lost because you can do so much more with the object when you have more evidence, right? So just looking at one leaf of the, the manuscript that I've been studying for years, the, the Bove Missal, looking at one leaf of the Bove Missal doesn't tell you much about the manuscript other than, oh, it's so pretty. Oh, it's from the late 13th maybe the very early 14th century. And oh, look, it has music. You know, you can talk about what the initials look like. You can look at what the text looks like. What kind of script is it? But you can't learn anything useful about the liturgy of Beauvais mm -hmm. until you look at 100 leaves or 200 leaves. I've now found 113 leaves. And once you start looking at the, the sum total of all of that material, you realize what you lose when you cut up a manuscript. And the other thing that you lose is the provenance information that you find inside the front cover or on the first leaf. If those are gone, they're gone forever. And that's information that is now lost. And that's a real intellectual loss when you lose that evidence. It's really important. And my own feelings about collecting my own collecting praxis. So I have a small collection of leaves, but I only buy Otto Eggy leaves. 
That's where I draw the line. I will buy something if I know it was cut up a hundred years ago by Otto Eggy or Philip Duchenes. I'm, I won't buy something if a dealer can't assure me, can't demonstrate that it wasn't cut up yesterday. You know, yeah. I will only buy leaves if I if I know the source manuscript. That's my own personal collecting practice. I actually have two leaves of the Bove Missal. Now I can show them to you there on my on my wall over there. <laughs> so I'm, I'm getting a tour of Lisa's office here. Oh, they are beautiful. <laughs> there, there they are. So I've, I've got two leaves there. And then I have another eggy leaf right there on the wall. That choir book leaf was a wedding present. So I couldn't control that. So that's my own decision, you know, about where I draw the line. I'm, I like buying eggy material. It's good for teaching. Very good for teaching. Ethically, I feel all right about that. But I would not buy something if I didn't know when it was dismembered. I think that's important. And I wanted to get into that argument because I think you did have a point in that, you know, more people can touch more leaves, but you're absolutely right now. More stuff is getting digitized. There is no reason for that. So, and what people might not realize is that many libraries, you can actually ask and you can actually get a hold of a manuscript. They will bring it, you see, you, you can actually see it and, and touch it without white gloves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so right, just no gloves, no gloves, no gloves. <laughs> You can just ask a librarian. So when you started, I was just reading your article that was in Florilegium and reading that it brought me back to when times were much more difficult to research this kind of stuff. And when you started putting together fragments, you had to photocopy them in and paste them in. <laughs> that was a long time ago. That was, you know, 35 years ago. Yeah. I mean, I, my dissertation was a fragmentology dissertation. But that word didn't exist yet. I didn't know that's what it was. But I was looking at a fragmented manuscript and trying to put it back together using black and white photocopies and scissors and paste on the floor <laughs> of my living room and everything spread out trying to shuffle the pages around. Yeah, those, those were the days. And then I had to, you know, walk through three feet of snow backwards to get to the <laughs> library. And, and it yeah. was uphill both ways. But <laughs> it uphill both ways, always. <laughs> <laughs> but it made me grateful because I remember how difficult it was to sometimes get your hands on this type of stuff. But mm -hmm. bring us up to speed. How is this working now? If somebody has a fragment, how are they sharing it and making it available to people to study and perhaps reassemble into a manuscript? So there are a lot of resources, a lot of projects happening now. The, the, there's a lot of momentum, I think, internationally about fragmentology, about getting this, people really starting to appreciate the value of it. Because these are really shabby. Sometimes they're in terrible condition. They're filthy. They've been cut and pasted. They've been abused. I want to give them some dignity back. You know, that's, <laughs> that's kind of how I feel about it. They deserve some respect. They've been through a lot. And so there is this wonderful resource called Fragmentarium that is a database with an underlying data model that is specifically designed for cataloging and working with fragments in that it, it has specific fields and drop-down menus and a whole ontology specifically for working with fragments. And it's run out of Switzerland by the same team that brought you eCodices. And it's a triple IF based image bank that allows you to use the power of triple IF to actually put fragments in the right order. So you can catalog in individual fragments and then you can create a digital reconstruction and actually start putting leaves back in the right order. And so that's where my Bobe Missile project lives on Fragmentarium. And I use it in my class at the Simmons University School of Library and Information Science, where I teach a course for grad students. It's called the Medieval Manuscript from Charlemagne to Gutenberg. So those are my that's my time frame. We start with Caroline and go up through printing. And in that class, as a final project, because my students are all future librarians. So we talk a lot about data modeling and we talk about cataloging and discoverability, and they each get a leaf to catalog from a particular Eggy manuscript. Everyone's working, we're all working on the same manuscript, but everyone has their own leaf from a collection somewhere in North America, and they have to catalog it in Fragmentarium. So they have to identify the text on the leaf and come up with their own thoughts about the date and place of origin and do a whole description of it and catalog it in Fragmentarium. And then the class works together 
to put the leaves back in the right order. And then once we've done that, we then dig into the reconstructed manuscript to see what we can learn that we didn't know before. They're usually books of ours. Can we determine the use of the manuscript based on the reconstructed liturgy? Can we learn anything about the provenance? And then we try to find it in the Schoenberg database of manuscripts. If we can find a sales record before it was broken, you know, based on the work that we've done, can we find something out about the object before it was dismantled? And that's been a really useful and productive project. And those are on Fragmentaria now forever, whatever forever means in the digital, in the digital world, they are permalinks. Yeah. And with Fragmentarium, if I'm understanding it correctly, because I haven't cruised this site myself, you can test these theories and it doesn't damage anything. You can just try things out and see, does this fit? And other people can contribute and have a look at that. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. Because it's IIIF, you can annotate and play around with the images without transforming the actual JPEG. That's, you know, the, the joy of IIIF is that it, it mirrors the image using the IIIF manifest when you want it, when you call for it using the permalink, the IIIF link, the image appears in the shared canvas viewer, whatever viewer you're using, and then you can annotate it and manipulate it. And it doesn't change anything from the original image file, which is one of the great things about IIIF is that you can have hundreds of people looking at an image at the same time and working with it without actually transforming it. Yeah, I think this is such a game changer and what a great technology. I mean, have everyone be able to work on the same leave at the same time and contribute things because with, as you were saying before, people with so many different skills, paleography, codecology, everybody has something they can contribute and really do some great detective work with this. Yeah, and you know, one of the big problems, at least in North America, is that there are so many fragments scattered and so many codices too, but but way more fragments than whole codices in North American collections. And they need to be cataloged in some way. But most collections don't have someone on staff who is a paleographer. They don't have someone on campus who's a paleographer. They may not even have, have a medievalist on campus, mm-hmm. in which case digitizing and just getting it online, even if you don't know exactly what it is. It's enough to say, here's a shelf mark, it's a medieval manuscript, and just put it online so that someone can find it that way. And then someone somewhere out in the world can catalog it and send you the information about it so that you can then add that to your record. There are several different schools of cataloging. Some people think you have to know everything about an object before you put it online. Mm-hmm. I do not feel that way. I think less is fine. As long as it's out there, someone will provide more. You don't have to wait until you know what it is before you put it online. I think you should put it online first and then let let the people come to you. Yeah, you don't have to do it all yourself. Crowdsource the work. That is why we exactly. have experts. I yes. want to circle back around to something that you mentioned because I don't want people to miss this because this is one of the most important reasons that you can reassemble a manuscript. And that is that you've said that when you put together a manuscript, you can trace it back to see what the provenance was before it sort of disappeared. So can you walk Mm -hmm. us through one of maybe a case study of this where you've put together something and then you found it again in a record? Yeah. So my students a few years ago at Simmons, we were working on a particular Eggy manuscript, one of the books of ours that he dismembered, really lovely early 15th century manuscript. And once we had enough leaves, so I think we had maybe 35 leaves that we had identified and we had put them back together. And then when we started to dig into the liturgy, we discovered that it was for the use of, I'm trying to remember, I feel like it was Chalon-sur-Marne in France. And once we knew that, and we knew that because we had enough liturgy that we could actually discover that by doing research into the, the use of the manuscript. And we knew the measurements, obviously, of the manuscript. We knew how many lines per leaf there were. And just armed with that information, we went to the Schoenberg database and started looking. Our book of hours, the use of Chalon-sur-Marne, you know, 17 lines per page from the early 15th century. And by using the different facets in the Schoenberg database to, to kind of narrow the results, 
we actually found a sales record from the 1930s from when the manuscript was still whole, from when it was still complete, before Otto Eggy bought it and cut it up. And once we knew that, then we knew how many leaves there were originally, because mm -hmm. the it was a Sotheby's sale and they they said there were originally, you know, 132 leaves. We knew how many miniatures there had been because the Sotheby's description described them for us. We knew something about the provenance because that was in the description, you know. So there's all this information that suddenly we can now attach to this object that was not known before. And so that meant I could reach out to all the, the institutions that own these leaves. The University of Toronto, for example, is one. The Ontario College of Art and Design has eggy material. I'm just throwing out Toronto, no reason. And then also <laughs> the some other collection in Toronto also has eggy material. And so once you have that, you can then reach out to the holding institution and say, you should add this information to your record for the manuscript because now I, you know, we used to know it was an early 15th century book of hours leaf, but now we know so much more. We know where it came from. We know something about its provenance. It makes the story so much more compelling that it's not just a random page with no background, with no context. Now we can really start to fill in the gaps. It's it's very satisfying, <laughs> quite thrilling, actually. I can imagine. And now that you've put these leaves back together, you can say, okay, we found this particular manuscript and we are missing these leaves so that if someone else has a leaf, they can be like, well, yeah. I have a picture of a knight and I have 17 lines. Maybe yes. this belongs to that. And so everyone- And that's happened. Continue. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that happens. It, it happens quite regularly that once I have put something out, I promote it on Twitter or on my blog or somewhere, and I will have someone email me and they'll say, oh, I think I have a page of that manuscript. Is this the same manuscript? And I can, one of the great things about doing this digitally, of course, is I can update it. I can just add a new leaf or I can replace bad images with better images or if a leaf changes hands, I can update that information. You know, it's all instantly and easily updatable, which is also an extremely important facet of doing the digital work. Yeah. And then the textual historians can look at it complete and the art historians can look at it complete. Hopefully yeah. it's complete. It's amazing work. Yeah. But yeah. speaking speaking of Twitter, you were just mentioning on Twitter, you had a very cool investigation going on not too long ago. Can you tell us a little bit about that? We can redact the names, but you made <laughs> oh. a discovery. <laughs> you mean about which, which one are you referring to? <laughs> you found one that was being auctioned, I believe, oh. or sold, and you were alerted to it because they were using yes. your own text, but then the yes, story got right. deeper. So there was, <laughs> yes. So there was a manuscript being sold on eBay where the, the seller had plagiarized my blog. He was in Louisiana and he, he went to my blog post about manuscripts of Louisiana and, and just lifted text and added it to the description of this manuscript wrongly the I, I mean it had absolutely no connection to the manuscript that he was trying to sell but once i realized what he had done i you know i wrote him and said you can't just plagiarize me right you need to either cite me correctly or remove remove this text and in fact you should remove it because it has nothing to do with the manuscript you're trying to sell so he did that but then i did a little more digging into the manuscript and i realized it should have been part of an institutional collection in Louisiana. And the investigation is still ongoing, so I can't say more than that. Yeah. But I realized that it was supposed to be part of an institutional collection and clearly wasn't. And so I contacted the institution and said, isn't this one of your manuscripts? And they said, oh, why, yes. <laughs> yes, it is. And so the police were called to investigate and the dealer removed it from eBay and voluntarily surrendered it and returned it to the institution, claiming that he had acquired it. Honestly, he didn't know, you know, he wasn't the one who stole it. We don't, mm -hmm. that's the ongoing part the <laughs> of, the, of the theft. Mm -hmm. And so this was a, a very satisfying for me, certainly in many ways, but that it's a, an example of how provenance research is actually really important. And it was only because of my 
work studying manuscript holdings in North America that I realized this manuscript was not where it should be. And I've done, I've done investigations like that actually for the US government. I am actually an official investigator for the US Department of Homeland Security, which handles art repatriation. And I've done several investigations for the government that resulted in manuscripts being returned to their European homes when it was discovered that they had left under circumstances that were not appropriate. <laughs> Let's say. I, I hope that you have a badge that has like an initial on it. <laughs> no, I wish. <laughs> I just wish. like a little gothic initial. I think that'd be amazing. Yeah, right. <laughs> no, it's, it's very satisfying and important work. A lot of manuscripts came to North America in the wake of, of World War II. Soldiers, you know, picking them up in Italy and putting them in a bag and bringing them over. And there are a lot of questions sometimes about a manuscript's provenance that really need to be answered. Sometimes there are no answers. Sometimes you can't prove one way or another how a manuscript made its way across the ocean. But that actually brings up a, another point for fragmenting, which is one of the things that's going on now, and this Eggy was guilty of this too, is this fetishization of manuscripts written in non-Latin scripts. So mm -hmm. things written in Syriac or Ethiopic or in Coptic languages or in Asian languages that are cut up, sold, today decontextualized completely sold to people who have no idea by people who have no idea what they are and that's a whole different problem because it ties into the ugly history of medieval studies from the 19th century and this idea that western languages are superior western manuscripts are superior somehow and manuscripts that are produced outside of that zone are somehow exotic and mm -hmm. fetishized in a way that that grows out of colonialist praxis. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I'm I'm really interested in and interested in trying to subvert and do some what in the library world is called reparative cataloging, where, for example, the, the Library of Congress only recently got rid of the word oriental. Yeah. And cataloging and replaced it with less racist and more appropriate <laughs> geographic terminology. That's just one example, but it's the sort of thing that really needs to happen. That if you find yourself in possession of a leaf of a Quran, for example, that's a problem, right? I mean, that's a book where the, the object is sacred to someone. And to just cut it up and decontextualize it and scatter it to the winds is really damaging and hurtful and is a real problem. And the repair work starts with cataloging. That's the first step, identification and cataloging. So that means that you need to find someone who reads Syriac. You need to mm -hmm. find someone who reads Ethiopic, who can actually tell you what this is and give it some context. That's the first step towards reparative work is knowing what the thing is that you're trying to recontextualize. That's hard for a lot of institutions because they don't they don't know where to start. They might have a box of fragments that just says miscellaneous fragments that no one can read. They pull a manuscript fragments in languages that there isn't someone in their library who knows how to read them. Mm -hmm. And so it is your responsibility, I think, as a curator to do the work to find someone who can tell you what this is. If you don't know what it is, find someone who can so that they can start that reparative work. It's, it's really important and it's just starting to be done. But I think that's the next phase, the next thing that has to happen. Well, I do want to get into what regular people can do if they come across a fragment. But while we're on the subject of curators, if a curator finds a box full of manuscripts that they can't read, is there a place they can go to find experts? Like, I'm sure there are experts that are like, call me, call me if you need help. Can you reach out to someone at Fragmentarium, for example, and ask for help? So Fragmentarium doesn't have a whole lot of non-Western fragments. There are fragments in Hebrew and Greek and languages that you might find in Western European contexts, mm -hmm. but you're not going to find much yet 
on fragmentarium in Syriac or Coptic languages or Asian languages. But you could put the material there. It's, it is designed so that you can arrange leaves to read from right to left, not just left to right. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, they've factored in that component of how languages work. So it isn't completely Latin specific. I have names, I have people that I can go to if there's a question about a particular language, but there isn't really a, a central clearinghouse for that kind of thing. Often what people will, you know, start Googling and they'll find their way to me and they'll email me and I'll say, oh, well, here's who you talk to about Armenian and here's mm -hmm. who you can talk to about Greek and things like that. But it would be great if there were just a central place where you could list people's names as a person to contact. It's a good idea, actually. <laughs> that would be really helpful, right? You know, like you went across the manuscript, it's in a language you, you can't read. You don't even know what language it is. And that's that's the first step. Well, if anyone is out there that is inspired to create this database, that would be great. <laughs> But for the people who might see a manuscript leaf on eBay, or they might find it in a relative's basement, what should they do with it? Because I think there are a lot of people who are listening that are now on the case. <laughs> they're looking, they're going to be looking on eBay for manuscripts. What uh, do they do? So in, in North America in particular, there are so many leaves that are in private hands. And not even people who consider themselves collectors. But someone whose grandma bought a leaf from Otto Eggie in 1936, and it's been hanging on the wall for generations. And, you know, people just walk by it. They don't really know what it is. So I would say first step is to take some pictures. That's the first step. You may want to, depending on how it's framed, you may want to remove it from the frame so you can see the other side. But you should have a professional do that. Always save the frame and save the mat. So even if you're going to take it out of a frame and have it rematted, save that material because it's important for the history of the manuscript. Otto Eggy, for example, used a really distinctive kind of mat for his leaves. And that's a really, it's important to hang on to that. They're very acidic. And if you happen to have leaves that are in those mats, you should remove them from the mats because the mats are not a healthy environment for them, but you should always save, save the mats. So that's step one. Take some pictures. You can even use just your phone camera. You don't have to go to some fancy digital lab and have them scanned. You could, if you want to have them scanned super high resolution with a color bar and color correction. And that's great if you can do that, <laughs> but you don't have to, you have an excellent camera in your hand at all times and phone pictures will do the trick. And then once you have that information, you need to get it out to the world, which means send it to me. <laughs> step one. That's a good step. I have a lot, a lot of images. You can put it on a blog. You can put it on Flickr. There are a lot of manuscript images that are on Flickr. That's a great place to post images with a medieval manuscript tag so that people can find them. You can contact your local special collections. Uh, if you, there's a university nearby, contact the special collections person and talk to them. They may want to buy it from you. They may be interested in acquiring it if you want to sell it, but they may also have ideas about how to publicize what you have. There are also lots of research resources to help you identify the material in your collection. I have lots of open access resources linked from my blog, manuscriptroadtrip.wordpress.com. <laughs> there's a, a tab for research resources, and there's a lot of open access resources that anybody can use to try and identify what kind of leaf they have, when and where it was written, and to help identify the text, and even to see if you can find, if it's an eggy leaf in particular, how to identify other leaves from the same manuscript, which is the, that's the fun part. Yeah. And I know that there are going to be people who are super interested in this, <laughs> the true crime 
aspect of this podcast for once, <laughs> tracking all this stuff down. So thank you for the resources. We will let people know how to find your blog in case they didn't write that down fast enough in the show notes. And hopefully we'll have more manuscript leaves being sent your way. Now, if, you have, a few, if you have a few more minutes, I wanted to ask sure. you about the Medieval Academy because you have been really important to the Medieval Academy, running it, making sure it runs smoothly. Can you tell us what the Medieval Academy of America is? Sure, thank you for asking. So yes, I am the executive director of the Medieval Academy of America. It is not a school for jousting. It, <laughs> <laughs> the Medieval Academy is a learned society. It's the professional organization in North America that supports the work of medievalists. We have uh, about 3,500 members. Most of them are in North America, but we do have members from all over the world. And we, in addition to publishing Speculum, which is the flagship journal of medieval studies, we also give out about $100,000 a year in grants and support to students, early career researchers, and other scholars, uh, independent scholars, people working beyond academia. And then also we have a conference every year, the Medieval Academy annual meeting that travels around the country, takes place in a different place every year. Uh, in 23, we're meeting in DC. Year after that, we'll be at the University of Notre Dame. And then the year after that will be our 100th anniversary and our wow. centennial meeting will take place in Boston, which is where our, our administrative office is. And we're doing a lot of work now, trying to do, again, the this reparative work in that you know, when we were founded 100 years ago, it was all white dudes who were in charge of this organization. And it has for a very long time had a reputation as a place that is not welcoming to anyone who's not a white dude. And honestly, that's not, I really believe quite strongly that that's no longer the case. For one thing, we're run almost entirely by women. <laughs> At this point, <laughs> our board is 80% women, our volunteer corps is probably two thirds women. And a lot of our grants and support are going not just to women, but also to BIPOC medievalists. And that's work that for me is, is so critically important that we become a place where everyone feels they have a home. And that includes LGBTQ community, it includes BIPOC scholars and students everybody. What I want for this organization is for it to be a place where there is room for everyone. And I firmly believe that there is. We need to, how did I put it in my, my annual report a few years ago, tear down the walls, open the gates, build a bigger table and raise a higher tent. That's what I want. I want everyone to just scoot over and make space because there is, like I said earlier, there is so much work to be done Mm -hmm. that there is no reason to not be welcoming. There's no reason to exclude anyone. Everyone has value. Everyone has work that's valuable and that's worthwhile. And I, I want to hear what everybody's up to. I want to hear what everybody's <laughs> work is. So that's what I'm, that's what I'm trying to do. And my board is, is trying to do that. That's what the organization is working towards. It's not just me. It's the whole governance making this a a space where all medievalists feel they have a home. That's what we want. That is excellent work. And you are preaching to the choir because I want to know what everyone is doing too. <laughs> now, the Medieval Academy tends to be a place where people who are doing the academic work assemble. <laughs> is there a space for it in the Medieval Academy for people who are armchair historians? Can they join it? Can they read Speculum? Or is this a place that is mainly... Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Yes, definitely. We do have a class of membership called Friends. There is a Friends of the Medieval Academy, as opposed to student or professional academic or independent scholar. We have a lot of different ways that people can participate. We have a sliding scale of membership dues and anyone who's a member receives speculum. Anyone who's a member can apply for funding, any of our funding programs. You can give a paper at our meeting. If you're a member, you don't have to be a member to attend the meeting. We welcome everyone. We have a growing contingent of K through 12 educators mm -hmm. because it's become really clear that we can and must have an impact on K through 12 curricula in North America in order to 
continue the work of not just broadening our membership, but also broadening what we mean by the Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. That's a really important piece of what we're trying to, to do. And it's where the field is going. You know, the, the idea that it's not just the upper left corner of Europe anymore, right? <laughs> it's all of Africa, not even just the Mediterranean coast, but all of Africa. It's Asia, it's the Middle East, it's Byzantium, it's Russia, it's all of Europe, Africa, and Asia. And we even have members who are working on the medieval period in North America, although that's a more complicated situation because, of course, that's its own field. But there definitely are, we do have members who are we're doing Indigenous studies and doing that in a comparative way, which is really interesting and exciting. So there's a lot of really exciting work happening right now. And there's room for the more traditional methods as well. It's not, nobody's being crowded out. There's room for everybody. <laughs> room for everybody. I think that is the perfect place to stop <laughs> because we've been talking for quite a long time and I do want to be respectful of your time. But yeah, there's a place for everyone and we will make sure that we let people know how to find the Medieval Academy. If you have never heard of it before, check it out because it's got lots of resources you can contribute, you can help people who are interested in the medieval world and yeah. also people who are scholars and just starting out and might need grants. So it's a great institution. Thanks yeah. for telling us about it. And thanks so much, Lisa, for coming on to talk about fragments. I think this is really interesting stuff and I'm so grateful you came on. Thank you. It's my pleasure. I really, I appreciate the invitation. Always happy to spread the gospel about fragments and fragmentology. To find out more about Lisa's work or to reach out to her about a fragment you found, you can follow her on Twitter at Lisa F. Davis, or you can visit her blog at manuscriptroadtrip.wordpress.com. To find out more about the Medieval Academy of America or to become a member, check out their website at medievalacademy.org. Before we go, here's Peter from Medievalist.net to tell us what's on the website. What's going on, Peter? Hey, hey. Well, we got some really exciting news. We are having our first online course. Woohoo! Following yeah. in my footsteps, right? <laughs> indeed, indeed. Yeah, you're the inspiration. And <laughs> what we've wanted to do is start being able to a place where we can offer people that have done teaching at universities or colleges, but they want to kind of teach to the wider world an opportunity like they can actually teach courses about the topics they love. This is going to be something we're going to be continuing and going on, but our first one is now available for pre-order and it's called the Viking Age. Sweet. The Viking Age, that's a good place to start. Who's teaching that one? Yeah, it's Terry Barnes, a historian. Uh, she's written for the site. She's taught at college levels, university level, and she's going to do a six-week course. There'll be live sessions what started the Vikings to the mythology to their society. And I think it's going to be really great. And I'm, I'm hoping people will sign up for it. So we're talking six weeks, one live class per week, and that's you get to learn everything you ever wanted to know about Vikings. That's right. That's right. From an expert. That's amazing. So where do people find this link if they want to sign up for it? They want to pre-order the course. Uh, just come on to medievalist.net. You can also check out Terry's new article, What Caused the Vikings, and it involves Breaking Bad. Sweet. That's amazing. Okay, so when you go to Medievalist.net, are you going to have a tab at the top that people can go to, or are you going to have a direct link that we can drop in our, our show notes this week? Yeah, we'll have a direct link you can drop in on the show notes, and we'll have plenty of links on the site as well. I got one more question for you, Peter. When is this course going to run? It's going to start the first week of September. Mm-hmm. And uh, it will run for six weeks and live classes will be Fridays. So everyone who wants to know about this course can just go to the show notes and you'll have a link for us there. That's amazing. Thanks, Peter, for that. Yeah. What else is going on on the site this week? Yeah, tons of articles from our writers. We're just still trying to catch up to all the stuff we have. So we have a piece on Jan Hus, the very interesting guy for the 15th century. And we also have a story of King Arthur's lovers. Wow. <laughs> That's scandalous. There's going to be a lot of scandal in that article. I know I, it. I, I didn't know there were scandals at Camelot. Everybody knows there's scandals at Camelot. That's kind of the whole shtick, man. Hey, but meanwhile, uh, your digital download is doing well, I hear. 
Yes. So my dirty words, 300 plus dirty, sexy words for writers is still available on my website. It's going to be available for a long time. So people can check that out. But yeah, people are starting to download it. It's starting to get some traction. And I'm hoping that writers will find it helpful if they need to write a steamy scene. They can just look at these charts that are based on the information from the Oxford English Dictionary about earliest use of dirty words. It was so much fun to put that together, I got to say. And I hope it's helpful to people. So people can find that on my website at Dan com slash shop. Yeah, I'm already using your insults. <laughs> yeah, you haven't used them on me so far. All right. Well, thanks, Peter, for stopping by. Thanks. Thank you, as always, to Medievalist.net's patrons on Patreon.com. Patrons can sign up for all sorts of amazing rewards like subscriptions to the Medieval Magazine and Medieval World Magazine, as well as ad-free versions of Medievalist.net. If you're enjoying this podcast, please consider signing up for Patreon, as your patronage directly funds both my podcast and others hosted by Medievalist.net. If you're already a patron, rest assured you have my undying gratitude. Thank you. For everything from fragments to fragrance, follow Medievalist.net on Facebook or Twitter at Medievalists. You can find me, Danielle Sabalski, on social media at 5MIN Medievalist or 5 Minute Medievalist. And you can find my books at all your favorite bookstores, where you can get hold of How to Live Like a Monk, Medieval Wisdom for Modern Life, in hardcover, ebook, and audiobook. You can find my new digital downloads, including 300 plus dirty, sexy words for writers, at daniellesabalski.com slash shop. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Gee Frog. Thanks for listening, and have yourself a fantastic day. <laughs>